Welcome to History Where It Happened. I'm your host, Dick Smith, and today we're at the Bennington Museum in Bennington, Vermont. And we're pleased to have uh, Callie Stewart, Callie, Hello. who is the collections manager today. And um, what are you going to tell us about the Bennington Museum? I'm going to tell you about the wonderful exhibits that we have here, show you some of our great artifacts, and explain a little bit about the history of Bennington for you. It's going to be a lot of fun. Let's go. Well, Callie, what is what is this? It looks like a Civil War statue or it monument. Is. This is Bennington's Civil War monument. Bennington actually had a custom-made monument, unlike most towns in Vermont and in the country have the single soldier standing with his gun. Right. Ours was made specifically for Bennington, and it has four generals who um, served with the Union Army, and every man from Bennington who served has his name on one of these little leaves, and some of them have little stars on them and the stars are for men who died in service. So it's, it's really quite special as, as, as monuments go, and it sits here on the grounds of the Bennington Museum. It is great, I mean, it's, uh, the relief is bigger here, and then they kind of fade in the background mm -hmm. here. Yeah, it, it's very well done. Well, let's go over here, there's one, I have a couple of questions about this building. All right, this is Grandma Moses' schoolhouse. She uh, attended the school while she was working in Eagle Bridge, Eagle Bridge as a hired girl, and it was moved to the Bennington Museum grounds in 1973, and they actually cut the building in half in order to transport it. So it was transported on two great big large trucks, one with the, the bottom part and one with the top part. The belfry was, of course, taken off as well, reconstructed here on our grounds, and um, is interpreted, it, it's not exactly interpreted as a school. We use it more as a, um, a friendly family space. So there are activities in here that kids can actually get their hands on and actually have fun. It's um, a great place to bring kids if you're coming to the museum and they need a little break to actually let off some steam and actually be able to touch things. Right. It uh, makes the, the uh, visit go a lot more smoothly. And Grandma Moses actually attended the school or went to the school? For a very short time, I think only maybe one one season when she was working as a hired girl. That, that's fine. And, and is. Eagle Bridge is, that's just over the border, isn't it? It in, is. In New yeah. York. Yeah. yeah, it's not very far from here at all. She grew up very close by and um, then she and her husband and when she got married moved down to Virginia for many years and then she moved back here. Um, and lived for the rest of her life in Eagle Bridge on farm uh, that's now owned by her great-grandson, Will Moses. Right. He's also still painting in a very similar style. And uh, they sell very famous sweet corn as well at the farm. <laughs> that's great. It is. Now maybe we can go into the uh, courtyard there. I had a couple yeah. of other questions about the building here. All right, let's go. Well, Callie, this is a beautiful spot, the entrance of this courtyard. Can you kind of give us a little background of uh, the building, especially this building? Sure, this building right here used to be the St. Francis de Sales, the first Catholic church here in Bennington. It was built in 1855, and by the late 1800s, it had really gotten to be too small for the Catholic congregation in town, so they built the new St. Francis, which is down the hill, very large Gothic um, uh, stone building. And this building was vacant for many years, and the Bennington Historical Society had recently built a monument dedicated in 1891 and was looking for a home for a museum. And in the 1920s, this building was available, and they were able to acquire the building. It opened in 1928 after lots of very expensive um, additions and you know, work on the interior so that it would be suited for a museum. And then over the years, it was added on to again and again and again. So you know, this was added, I think, 1938. More was added in 50s and 70s, 60s. And so you end up with the large complex that we have today. That's great. You can even see the original, I guess those are the original church yep. type. Yep. Uh, they, yeah, those are the original been... kind of Gothic windows. That was very fashionable at that time. Um, and it's, uh, there's a painting inside that we can see too that's quite nice. It's of the, the church. It depicts um, early mass on Easter Sunday where the church was not large enough to hold all the congregants. So they're all kind of kneeling outside, which is quite nice. And you get a, a good idea of what the church looked like at the time. That's great. But there's one thing here that fascinates me in all the yes. time that I've come is this statue. It fascinates many people of Abe for Lincoln. various reasons. Unique is a polite way to put it. Please explain this. Yes, this sculpture is by Clyde DuVernay Hunt, who was a uh, member of the Hunt family in, from, originally from around Brattleboro, contained a lot of very famous artists. William Morris Hunt, Richard Morris Hunt was a famous architect. 
And Clyde DuVernay grew up in France, but he was very connected with his Vermont roots and with his American roots and was a sculptor as well as a painter. And the problem with this particular sculpture is that it's taken from three different pieces and then combined into one not terribly successfully. The title is The American Spirit or Faith, Charity and Hope. And the idea is that the lady represents faith, Lincoln represents charity, and the boy represents hope. And originally, and you'll see this when we go inside, we have a marble version of the naked lady titled Nirvana, which is how Hunt originally envisioned her. She represented you know, the, the ideal of Nirvana, you know, and you can kind of see that in her face. It's very peaceful, very, you know, uh, faithful, I guess, would be another way to look at it in, as in this statue. The boy was originally a bronze, and he was titled Fille de France, and he was created right after World War I, after France was really suffering from the horrors of war. And so Hunt created this smaller sculpture as a way to explain or, or to give hope to France. He's the son of France, the hope of France. And, you know, he's, he's proud, he's um, innocent, and he's, you know, looking forward to a, 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 better, a better life for the French. In this sculpture, which Hunt created for the um, Illinois Pavilion at the New York State Fair in 1939, he kind of combined these sculptures with a sculpture of the fully clothed Lincoln. And of course, the fully clothed Lincoln with the naked boy and the naked lady is a little bit strange, especially for us today, <laughs> because you don't really expect that. But at the time, it was seen as a, a fine piece of art. The museum acquired a, a, this bronze statue in 1949. After the World's Fair, it was given to us by Hunt's uh, son and his daughter. And it has been here ever since, and it definitely elicits a lot of comments from people coming to visit us at the museum. It's especially a favorite with school groups, but, um, not in a good way. So this was actually on display at the 1939 World's yes, Fair? Yes, it was. And where what, was it, at the New York State Pavilion? No, it was at the Illinois, the, the Illinois, 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 Illinois sorry, State right, Pavilion, right. Lincoln. He sure put Lincoln in a big, <laughs> yes. big proportion. And, and that's one of the problems is that the three figures really aren't proportionally correct for each other, yeah, yeah. which is another thing that just makes the statue not quite work as a whole. One, one great thing about the Bennington Museum is they have something for everybody. And this room is Bennington Modernism, uh, and really is modern, modern art, I guess you would say that, Callie. Yes, I'm, I'm not it's absolutely for, modern art. I don't it's know not what one of my favorite. Call. I love historical art, but this is wonderful. There's something for everybody. But this is historical art. In the 1960s, I'm sorry, but this is history. It's more current history than you might like to think, but this is history. Okay. Bennington College in the 1960s and 50s was a hotbed of modern art. This is where color field painting, as you see with the Paul Feely pieces on the end there, really got its, uh, its start. We also have paintings by Jules Olitsky. This is a very recent gift to the museum. We're very proud of it. And uh, Helen Frankenthaler, this piece is on loan to us from Bennington College. And it's, it was a very important part of what Bennington was in the 1960s and the, the mid 20th century. And so, it, and it's something that we're kind of starting to think more about, like what was going on in Bennington in the 1960s, in the 1970s, and how, because Bennington was changing at that time. And it's, all of these things really interconnect in really interesting ways. And we've actually been talking about doing an exhibit on Bennington in the 60s because, of course, lots of interesting things were happening in the United States in the 60s. So, I mean, in music, in art, in culture, in counterculture. And there are things that were happening in Bennington in particular, in the education movement and at Bennington College, too, which was very, very right, much in the, right. the forefront of this. We're, we're now in the uh, Gilded Age Vermont room of the Bennington Museum. And one of the objects here is the car. If you could give us a brief summary of it and background and why here, why a car? The, the car is one of the coolest things in our collection. It was the only car ever made in the state of Vermont. It was made by, right here in Bennington by Carl Martin. And he was trying to make a car that was uh, over the top even for its day. This was made in the 1920s 
when there were a lot of these little mom and pop operations. Um, you had your big, you know, Ford, but you also had a lot of very small companies who were making very specialized cars for a very particular audience and were only making a few of them. There were only about two dozen of these Martin Wasps ever made. This is the only one that currently exists in um, anything like its original condition. And like I said, it was made for a very select uh, group of people. It was a very expensive car. And it was made for the likes of um, Douglas Fairbanks, who ordered one of the first ones for his wife, his wife, Mary Pickford. This particular one was made for a man who ordered it, but then passed away before it was completed. And losing that sale was actually enough to put the entire company out of business. So what Carl Martin did was drove the chassis around for many years, simply you know, for transportation. It was later acquired by a collector in Ohio who trucked it out and actually restored it to its original glory and then donated it to the Bennington Museum, which is why here it is right now. That's absolutely fascinating. Is this, um, is it in running condition or it, could it, it be run it, or is it, a, I mean, is it close enough to, if you really? It is in running condition. We don't run it simply because there's really nowhere for it to go in here. You could go a few feet forward and backwards perhaps, but not enough to make it worth it. And in order to get it into the museum, we had to almost completely disassemble it. So it's not something that we uh, can easily, you know, take it out and take it for a spin or, right, you know, right. drive it in the Bennington Battle Day Parade and then just, you know, park it back here where it belongs. So when we moved it into this gallery, we actually had to take the door jams off this, uh, the doorway to this gallery in order to fit it through. There was like that much left on either side, um, and it barely squeezed in. So we, we don't move it very often, and we don't run it anymore. That's terrific, Kelly. Um, there are a couple of other things now. Is the flag in the back, is that part of this gallery, or is that it, the quilt, or is it... Uh... Well, this, this gallery is really looking at the Gilded Age in Vermont. Right. So we're looking at right. you know, so very fancy make... things. And right. Vermont at this time was... Uh, an industrial state, or at least Bennington was, was very much a factory town. And that money is what allowed people to buy things like beautiful SD organs and, you know, lovely paintings and this, you know, beautiful Is this an original parts. SD? This is an original SD organ. This that, is a- That was made in, what, in Brattleboro. Brattleboro. Yep. Brattleboro. Yes, yes. It's one of the, it's a top of the line SD organ too. Um, it was uh, owned by the Christian Science um, church here in Bennington, and when they moved out of their current building, it's now a private house, they gave the organ to us, and so it was a, a very nice organ donation. That's great. It is. Do you want to see the flag? I'd like to. I don't All know right. how we're going to do with light and everything, but let's we try have and... a problem with light, yes. Let's, which way do we go? This way? Okay. Well, we're here, and I know it's probably hard on the screen, and maybe... Uh, Maybe that's a reason to come here, but uh, what we're looking at is the, what we call, I refer to it as the Bennington flag, but Callie, I don't know, is there a better description and a little of the history, but it looks like that's the original flag. This is the original flag. We know very little about the actual origin of this flag. The story when the museum acquired it in 1928, when we opened, was that this was the original flag that had been at the Battle of Bennington. It had been saved by Nathaniel Fillmore, who was a veteran of the battle, and then given to his nephew, Septa, Septimus Fillmore, who was a veteran of the Battle of Plattsburgh in the War of 1812, and had then been handed down through his family until it was given to the museum by Maud Fillmore Wilson. And in the 1990s, we actually had the flag taken out of this frame. This frame was specifically created for the flag at a rather great expense for 1928. And we had a, a scientific analysis done on the fibers and did some conservation work to it. And what they found was that the flag contains cotton fibers of a type that were not available in 1777. So it absolutely does not date to the Battle of Bennington. It could date to the War of 1812, and it probably dates to at least the 1820s, if not a little bit older when this particular um, type of cotton thread was widely available. Um, but we don't know for sure. So, and I've not been able to find anything that really um, nails it down, but it's, it's a very unique flag. It has you know, the 76, which is of course a reference to um, the Declaration of Independence and uh, the 
um, the founding of the country in, in 1776. It has, you know, the seven pointed stars, which I suspect are actually a reference to one of its early owners, Septimus Fillmore, supposedly the second owner of the flag. I think he might have been the first. I mean, seven pointed stars are, to me, a rather obvious reference and to his name. And there's 14 of them. There are 13 of them, 13. I believe. One, two, 13. three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Um, you're, you're right. There's, uh, I, yeah. It's funny. I, I, I am often right. Four, um, <laughs> <laughs> it was never an official flag, but yeah. at the time, there really was no official flag of the United States. A lot of people used what we refer to as the Betsy Ross flag, which has you know the circle of 13 stars. Right. Other people arranged them in completely different ways. And as long as there were you know 13 stripes and 13 stars, you could arrange them in any way you like, and it was an official United States flag. Well, this certainly has been uh, associated with with Bennington. I mean, if you yes, Google, it has. Google and you order, mm -hmm. if you want there's this a lot, flag, there, you there's know, a Bennington lot flag. of misinformation out there about this flag. Um, but the problem is that we don't know an awful lot about it, so there is an element of mystery to it. But it's it has such a wonderful design, and whether it is from the Battle of Bennington or not. It certainly has a very strong local connection because it has been here since 1928, and um, we've really kind of we've owned it, and it's it's just fabulous. One other thing too, I'm going to turn around and could you give a quick quick summary of uh, quilts and you have a lot of quilts in the collection. We have we estimate that we have about uh, I don't have to estimate I think there are about 70 quilts in our collection. The most famous, of course, is the one made by Jane Stickle, which is not this quilt. But it will be on, on display in uh, September and October when we get our most visitation. It has a very devoted following. But we uh, rotate our quilts regularly because, like with all textiles, if, you, um, if they're exposed to too much light, they fade very quickly. I mean, as you notice with the flag, it's almost gray. There's very little left to it. This, this quilt in particular is interesting because these designs here are not pieced. This is stenciled. So what someone did when they made this was they took the, the fabric, took their paints, took a stencil, and just stenciled this on, which is much easier than actually doing all that little piece work, and then made these little stars as well. And then it's quilted around that after they, they had made the design. And then it has this wonderful kind of grapevine rose motif around the, the borders too, which is really quite lovely. Um, and the vine and floral motif is a little bit more common with stencil quilts. You don't often get them with the geometric design that this one has, which is rather interesting. Um, there are some houses in Vermont that have a similar stencil pattern to uh, this one here. If you've ever been up to the Shelburne Museum, they have the stencil house where the walls of this entire right, house are right. beautiful, beautiful stencils on them. And it's one of the rooms has a, a sort of similar floral design on the walls. I'm not a quilt expert at all or know very little about quilts, but I did come to a presentation here on the Stickle mm -hmm. quilt, which you mentioned, which I guess will be on display. And I remember uh, fascinating that it was something like 5,000 pieces to the... Yes, to, to that the, one, that is an incredible uh, That's almost worth a, a trip to the museum alone. And it, that is. Stickle's buried here. She's buried in Shaftesbury, Vermont. In Shaftesbury, yep, right. Yep, that's where she lived all of her life. And she's another rather mysterious um, person. We don't know an awful lot about her life, um, mostly because, you know, as a woman, that women's history is not very well recorded often. Right. Uh, what we do know about, about that quilt is that it was uh, exhibited in the, oh, the Bennington County Fair, I think, for 1863. And she actually won an D award for it. During the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. during the Civil War. Which is when it actually has you know, in wartime written in the signature corner, which is part of what makes it so remarkable. And there is a, uh, a description of the fair that was printed in one of the local papers. And they mention the fact that she was an invalid woman who had created this wonderful work of art. And um, which it kind of helps us to understand her because, yes, women were making quilts all the time in the 1860s, but very few of them had the time or resources to make something quite as elaborate as hers. And, and that'll be on display September or October? Yes. Well, Callie, this is, this is one of my favorite rooms here. Uh, I guess you call it the Battle of Bennington Room. Yes, it is. This is our military gallery where we talk about the Battle of Bennington, which happened not very far from here at all, over in uh, Bloomsack, New York. 
Um, of course, during the battle, the British were trying to get supplies. Burgoyne was coming down from Canada and knew he was running short on supplies. He was making lots of very good progress and his supply trains weren't keeping up with him. So he needed to get supplies and he heard that there was a, um, a depot here at Bennington where, he, where the um, Continental Army was gathering supplies. And so he sent a, a detachment of troops down to Bennington. They were soundly defeated by the American troops. General Stark was over from New Hampshire, the um, Green Mountain Boys were involved, the militia in Bennington were involved, and successfully defeated the British. And after the battle, we see this, what happens in this painting here. And these are the prisoners um, from the Battle of Bennington being brought to Bennington, where they were kept in the Meeting House. This is where the old First Church is now. This was the first Meeting House. And they were also kept in the Walloom Sack Inn. This is what the Walloom Sack Inn looked like many, 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 many years ago, around 1777. Of course, it looks very different now. And the, uh, the cemetery is still the original. That's still there. Yes, yes, it is. And you can see that the Meeting House was kind of across the road from the cemetery. The church right now is sort of where the right cemetery here. is. Um, they actually moved some of the gravestones when they built the church. Um, so in this painting, we see General Stark here on his horse. This is Stark's flag behind him. We actually have this part of the flag in our collection. Um, we see some of the other uh, people who were involved in the battle. You have your British redcoats. You have your Hessian Herrick soldiers. And, um, um, Seth Warner, Warner, I think. Wait, yes. Warner. Um, and you kind of get an idea of the, the global um, scope of this battle. You have people from all over the place who are gathering in Bennington. After, after this battle takes place. It was probably the most exciting thing that had ever happened in Bennington. It might still be the most exciting thing that had ever happened to this town. And, and when, when was this painted? This was during the... Um, this painting was painted w during the Great Depression. It was WPA piece. It was sponsored right. by the, the Works Progress Association. It was painted by Leroy Williams, who was a Vermont artist who, like many other artists during the Great Depression, was out of work. And the museum commissioned him to create this mural for us to um, kind of commemorate Bennington's part in, in the Revolutionary War and maybe one of our proudest moments. So and we have quite a few other paintings in our collection that were also painted through the WPA. What, what I really like is that this was done as a, to portray where the prisoners came back and it really hasn't changed much. I mean the cemetery is still here. I guess there's a plaque. I don't know, in there's the quite a bit that's changed. This building is completely is gone. gone. Yeah, the church gone is the there. And the Loom Sack Inn is unrecognizable. It's, it's, still, it's the, still there. That's the artist's. Uh, the, well, this uh, is what it looked like. There's yeah. actually a painting that includes the Loom Sack Inn that was painted in the 1790s. And this is what it looked like it was a gambrel roof building, it was only two and a half stories. It has a, a little porch on the front, but it's not the same porch that's there today. There right. were many other changes in between. Um, there's a lot of other buildings that, of course, have come up over the years as well. The cemetery is still there, and you know, the mountains are still the same, too. And you can still, you can tell the Hessians with their, mm -hmm. I don't know how you describe their, their profession. Whatever the, the headgear is called, I, I don't know now there's what one the, other, the technical word is for that. There's one other artifact here that I love, mm -hmm. and it's over here. And this is great. It is, it is. That is absolutely great. This it, is one of the cannon that was captured at the Battle of Bennington by the American troops. There were four cannon that were captured, two of these smaller ones and two larger ones. The two smaller ones were given to the state of Vermont in 1845, I think. And this one was brought to the Bennington Museum when we opened in 1928, to, um, because this is you know, where the battle happened. And it's, it's a small cannon, which would have been extremely um, practical for the, the um, terrain that they were fighting in. They weren't really able to, oh, they could, but it was much harder to really carry a large cannon over this really bumpy um, wilderness. And as Burgoyne was coming down, of course, the American troops were trying to do everything they could to destroy the roads and destroy anything that would have helped him, you know, make his way here. So a small cannon like this was easy to pick up and carry. And then after the Americans captured it, it was easy for them to transport this to wherever they were going next. And um, in this case, Saratoga, 
where they completely defeated the British and ended this whole idea of this northern campaign that, that Burgoyne had been trying to, um, the, the idea that the British, was that the British were going to cut off New England from the rest of the colonies because New England was really the, the source of a lot of the unrest in the colonies and the, the seat of the revolution. So by cutting off New England, they hoped to really squelch the Americans. It didn't quite work out that way. I've, I've seen, I guess, I guess it would be called the sister cannon is on mm -hmm. the, um, in Montpelier on the yes, front of the, the state house. Yes, it's right it is. there. And I think they have it, uh, if I remember right, they have a carriage with it. They yes. They have the original carriage. It's, it's not the original carriage. They were remounted at the Waterville Arsenal in 1845 when they were presented to the state of Vermont. So. It's, a, it's sort of an original carriage, but it's not original to the battle. Um, the, this one had, an, had that carriage as well when it came to the museum. Right. And we simply don't really have room to display it in this gallery. It's a fairly small room. Yeah. And it took up a lot of floor space for um, what it is. And you get the idea of, uh, of um, how nice it is, I think, in a case. I think w one time on battle day, it wasn't this year, but a couple of years ago, they actually brought you mentioned there were four. Mm -hmm. The third, uh, the fourth one was over in New Hampshire, the Molly Stark, and they yes. brought it here. And I think they were firing it. I think at, they do fire their yeah. cannon regularly too. I, I not something that I would do, but if you're comfortable with the the um, condition that your cannon is in, then by all means, it's well, a lot of fun to fire them off. This is this is a great room, and there's maps here explaining the whole battle and everything. So this this is a room that really deserves a half an hour. To, to go through everything here. Well, let's go on to, uh, I see Grandma Moses is uh, the inside yes, of Grandma's. Yes, the inside of Grandma's schoolhouse. Let's go. Can we go?